Well, every year, 2.3 million people get married in the United States. Uh, and the sad reality is, about half of them will end up in divorce. And they end up in divorce primarily because of broken promises. They don't fulfill the vows they take, like promising to be faithful and respectful and trustworthy, like promising to help and care for their spouse in sickness and in health, in riches and in poverty. And people break promises all the time because we live in a broken and fallen world. Parents break promises to their children. Bosses break promises to their employees. Sports teams, these are the ones we live around, they break promises to their fans. Politicians are notorious for breaking promises, and truthfully, odds are maybe they never intended to keep them anyway. When President Woodrow Wilson was running for re-election in 1916, he promised America to keep us out of World War I. One year later, we were in World War I. In 1964, Lyndon B. Johnson promised that he would not send our boys into Vietnam. But during his presidency, he sent our boys into Vietnam. In 1968, Richard Nixon promised he would end the Vietnam War in his term. He didn't do it, not until the second term in 1973. President Jimmy Carter, Carter promised to solve the energy crisis, but it only worsened under his administration. President Ronald Reagan promised to make a constitutional amendment allowing prayer in schools. Never did it. President George H. Bush promised saying, read my lips, no more taxes. And yet he raised them. <laughs> President Bill Clinton promised to renovate the healthcare system with Hillary Care. That never happened. President George W. Bush promised to pri privatize Social Security, which never happened. President Barack, Barack Obama promised, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. That was untrue. Many people lost their doctors under Obamacare. President Donald Trump promised to lower drug prices. That didn't happen. And a long list, and probably still growing, on President Biden's promises that are broken, things like controlling the border, things like helping the economy, and so on. And, and so we see promises are broken, and they're broken on a big scale, and they're broken on a smaller scale. Back in 1995, Claudia's, my wife's Claudia's 80-year-old uh, uncle needed a place to live, and for lots of reasons, it wasn't good for him to live with us. And I made her the promise. I said, I give you my word, I promise you, he won't live in our house. I broke that promise. He lived with us for eight years. <laughs> Point is, we break promises. The thing is, God is a promise keeper, and he expects his people to be as well. And the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians to keep their promise to give to the suffering saints in Jerusalem. About a year before, they started to collect money to send to the Jerusalem saints, but for some reason, they stopped. And now, Paul wants them to fulfill their promise and finish what they started. And chapters 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians are dedicated to this. They're dedicated to this. In fact, nowhere in Scripture is there so much ink on giving. As Paul is encouraging them and challenging them and teaches them on the biblical grace of giving. And he's using, he starts out using the example of the Macedonians, and then he moves over to Christ, who, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. So Paul wants them to keep their promise uh, and, the, and, and then have the money collected and sent to the Jerusalem saints. And he is careful not to touch the money himself. But his adversaries have accused him of many things, one of which was being a huckster or, or financially impure. Uh, so what he does is he puts together a, th a team of three men, a delegation, uh, who were all well regarded uh, by the church and the saints to carry out this collection. And now in verses 1 to 5 of chapter 9, he wants them to be prepared when the delegation gets there. What I'd like to do today is look at these verses, one to five, in a sermon titled, Be Ready to Give, using a three-point outline. And that is, first of all, giving encourages, the giving collected, and finally, giving generously. So let's look at giving encourages, verses one and two. And I'll read it again. He says, Now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you 
But I know your willingness, about which I boasted of you to the Macedonians, that Achaia was ready a year ago, uh, and your zeal has stirred up the majority. Well, Paul starts by saying, now concerning the ministering to the saints. And the word ministering comes from the word that we get deacon from, and it means to serve. It means to serve. Uh, and the ministering and the serving that it's in view here uh, is the offering the Corinthians promised to give to the suffering saints in Jerusalem. So giving is a ministry. You may not think of it that way, but it is. For it is blessing and helping and serving the saints. Uh, and it is aiding the work of the church as it marches forward. Uh, so when you give to the saints, you are ministering to them. Uh, just as much as you do when you are discipling them, or you're helping them move, or you're watching their kids so they could go out and, on a date and so on. Uh, so we should see your giving to the church and to the saints as ministering, serving. Uh, and listen, when you minister to the saints, you, you're ministering to God's children, to those who are purchased by His Son's blood. Those who 1 Peter 2 says are his own special people. And as Psalm 17, 8 says, are the apple of his eye. Well, Paul says, it is superfluous for me to write to you. And superfluous means not necessary. It means more than sufficient. Uh, so, so I don't need to write to you because I know you know this. I know you know this. And the question is, what do they already know that Paul doesn't need to tell them again? And, and what that is, is about this collection and the reason for this collection. They already know about the desperate need of the poor and suffering saints in Jerusalem. They know that. Paul's already told them that a year ago. And they understood it. And they were desirous to help and to give to them. He even gave them a plan to help them gather up that collection, which again is in 1 Corinthians 16, which we read today. I'll read it again. He says, Now concerning the collection for the saints... As I have given orders to the churches in Galatia, you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay aside something, storing up as he may prosper. Let there be no collection when I come. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting uh, that I also go also, uh, they will go with me. So then, Paul doesn't have to go over this stuff again. He's told them this, and they know this. Hey, listen, every time we take an offering in this service, we don't have to tell you why we're taking the offering again. Mike Archer doesn't have to get up here uh, and, and, and give you a categorized breakdown of where every dollar goes. Right? He doesn't have to do that, saying, well, some goes to operating expenses, and some goes to the missions, and some goes to elders' funds. He doesn't have to do that. So it would be superfluous for him uh, to, to pull out the treasurer's report every Sunday and read it to you. Just like it would be superfluous for me to tell you why you should get to the service before it starts or why you should go to Sunday school or Bible study. For I've told you those things already in the past and I know you know them. But truth be told, I know we forget these things once in a while and every now and then we need a little nudge. So I may do that. But Paul's point is this. You know about the offering. Uh, you know why there is an offering, uh, and, and you've previously committed to this. Well, then he says in verse 2, For I know your willingness. Willingness means zeal. It means eagerness, readiness of mind. Uh, and, and what they were eager and ready to do was to give to this offering. They were eager to store up money and then have it sent to Jerusalem. Paul said to them in 2 Corinthians 8, he said, but now you also must complete the doing of this. This is the offering. Uh, that as there was a readiness to desire it, so there also may be a completion of what you have. So they were ready. They were willing to give. And we see this word willingness used of the Bereans in Acts 17. They received the word of God with all readiness. Willingness and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were true. So Paul goes there, preaches the gospel. They didn't just shoo him away. Right? They searched the scriptures. They were ready to hear it, ready to search. They were ready to do that. So Paul, Paul knows their willingness to help the saints at Jerusalem. He knows their willingness to bless them who are needy. He knows they desired to give and they were ready to give. And being ready and willing to do something is good. 
is good because no one should do anything they are not ready and willing to do. Nobody should be roped into or guilted into or forced into anything. No one should be manipulated or guilted uh, to do anything in the kingdom of God. And that includes giving money. That includes giving money. Everything we do in the kingdom should be done from a willing heart. Because if you don't do it from a willing heart, I, quite honestly, God doesn't accept it. And it's done for another motive. And it's not a good one. We should do it from a heart that is compelled by the love of Christ that he has for us. You see, the, the natural response to his love should be to give. The natural response of his love should be for us to go, to serve, to help, to obey. But if we say we want to help, that we want to give, then we should follow through on it. If the Lord has put something or someone on your heart uh, and, and you say, I, I want to help them, uh, but you never actually help them, or you start and then you stop, which is the case here with the Corinthians, what good was your willingness? What good was your willingness? So when the need was presented to the Corinthians, they didn't roll their eyes and pretend not to hear Paul. Oh, here, oh here's Paul. He's asking for money for the, for the saints in Jerusalem. They didn't just roll their eyes and not say, wow, well, maybe he won't look at us. They heard it. They didn't say, let me think about it. Paul, we'll get back to you on this one. We've got to really consider this one. No, they were eager to help. There's a need, we want to help. We want to help. Right? They didn't have to be strong-armed into this thing. They were willing, and they committed to give. And Paul boasted about their willingness to the Macedonians. Uh, we, read, we read, about which I boast of you to the Macedonians that Achaia was ready a year ago. So a year before, Paul said to the Corinthians, I'm taking an offering for the suffering saints in Jerusalem. Uh, and the church at Corinth said, we're in. Count on us. We're in. And remember, Paul had spent 18 months with the Corinthians, and they were close to him. And they knew his heart. They knew his heart for the poor and suffering saints in Jerusalem. And at that point, they had the same heart. And then Paul goes to the Macedonians, and that's the northern part of Greece, by the way, which the churches of Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea were. And he says, he says to them that Achaia has a real willingness to give to this. And Achaia was the southern part of Greece. Uh, that's, where the, that's, where, that's where the... the, the, the um, where am I? That's where, where Corinth was and Crete was. So Paul boasted about the Corinthians to the Macedonians, about the grace of God in their lives. Uh, and he had no doubt about their readiness and willingness to give a year before. He knew that they had an eagerness, as Galatians 6.10 says, to do good to all, but especially to the household of faith. He knew they had a desire, as 1 Timothy 6.18 says, uh, to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Now I want you to consider something here. The Corinthians were a church with a lot of problems. They had a lot of sin issues. They gave Paul a lot of agita. They are the only church that he wrote a severe letter to. Yet, he didn't paint them in a negative light to the Macedonians. He didn't disparage them to the other churches. No, he told them positive things about the Corinthians. You know, it's easy to see the negatives or the problems of a church. Ah, oh, the music is so slow. The pastor talks so fast. They could be a little friendlier. A little loose in this area, a little loose in that area, maybe too tight in that area. Paul doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. Oh, let me tell you how bad the Corinthians are and then roll out the list that we read in 1 Corinthians. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that at all, and nor should we. Nor should we. We should look for the good. We should accentuate the positive. So Paul boasted about the Corinthians to the Macedonians. He doesn't condemn them. And what that, that did for the Macedonians? Well, well, Paul says their zeal, the zeal of, of the Corinthians, stirred them up. And zeal means excitement of mind, fervor of spirit. And, and the, Lord, the Lord himself had zeal, did he not? When he overturned the money tables in the, in the, um, in the temple. We read in, in John chapter 2, then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. 
And we see that the Corinthians had zeal for Paul once again, uh, for they had repented of their sin against him. And we read that in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, and their zeal for desiring to help the saints in Jerusalem, that was stirred up the Macedonians to give. Uh, and if you remember at the beginning of chapter 8, the Macedonians, they were a poor and afflicted group of churches. Verse 2 said they had severe affliction. It also says they had extreme poverty, but mixed with abundant joy, which overflowed into generous giving from them. Then verse 3 says that they gave not only according to their ability, but beyond their ability. And Paul doesn't even want them to give. He doesn't want them to give. For he knew that they could barely make, make ends meet where they, where they were now. He knew things were super tight for them. But because they had first given themselves to the Lord, he says, and because of their abundant joy in the Lord, they didn't want to be denied the blessing of giving. Even though if any church, any church could have used the excuse, we're too poor to give, it would be the Macedonian churches. And the catalyst for the Macedonians' desire to give was hearing of the zeal and eagerness of the Corinthians to give. So as Paul said, it stirred them up, right? And your zeal has stirred up the majority. Your zeal, wanting to give, has stirred up the majority, the Macedonians. So the Corinthian zeal was contagious. And listen, so is your zeal. Your zeal for the Lord is contagious. Your zeal to give and to give generously, regardless of whatever's going on in your life, can stir up others to give generously too. Right? Your zeal to worship God can stir up others to worship God as well. I've said this in the past. When Kelvin Candelario came here about 10 years ago, the guy was on fire for Christ. He had this burning passion to reach the lost. He had a zeal for evangelism, and his zeal for evangelism was contagious for some of us, quite a few of us, but certainly for me. Right? It, it reflamed, if you will, the embers of my own heart for evangelism again. It moved me and others to hit the streets with the gospel. And your zeal to learn the word could stir up the zeal for others to learn the word. Your zeal to serve could move others to want to serve as well. So the principle here is generous giving encourages generous giving, just as stingy giving encourages stingy giving. So your zeal can stir up the slumbering saint to live a more intentional kingdom life. Hebrews 10, 10, 24 and 25 says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So we should be stirring each other up to love and good works. Love for God, more and more love for God, love for the saints, love for the gospel, love for the lost. For we won't be about the good works God has prepared for us to walk in if we are not motivated by love. Nobody does anything in the kingdom of any value unless you are motivated by love, God's love for you, and therefore your love for him. Paul said, I am compelled. The love of Christ, com Christ compels me. And, and notice what we read in verse 25 of Hebrews. Uh, Don't neglect going to church. Don't neglect assembling with the body. Uh, and one reason why is because that is where the stirring up happens, right? That's where the one anothering takes place in the community of the body. And if you would rather watch the service on Facebook Live than assemble with the body, well, then you're not being stirred up and you're not stirring anybody else up, so to speak. Uh, so your zeal can stir up the saints for good or it can sort of stir them up for laziness or bad. If you're zealous for godly things, if you're zealous for godly living, you stir up people for good. You stir up people for good. But if you're zealous for your hobby, stock market, your team, entertainment, decorating your house, going on your vacations, well, you can be stirring up the saints for worldly living. And by the way, stirred up means to excite, to stimulate. And each of us 
should be about the business of stirring up the saints for God's glory. But you can't be stirring up the saints if you're not fellowshipping with them. If your time here is in and out, if you're not doing life with the people of God, you can't be stirring them up to love and good works, nor can you be stirred up by them. If your time here is basically, if your time is basically spent with unbelievers, then it may well be you're being stirred up by them. So let us advance the kingdom by living in such a way that we are stirring up the saints and being stirred up. So we see God, first of all, in this word, is telling us that giving encourages. Secondly, giving collected. The giving collected, verses 3 and 4. He says, Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that, as I said, you may be ready, lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. Well, Paul tells the Corinthians he knows they were eager to give a year ago, and because of that, they start up the Macedonian saints. And now he says he put a plan in place to help them to follow through on their promise to give uh, and to spare him and them any embarrassment of them not being ready. So he says, yet I have sent the brethren. I have sent the brethren. Uh, and, and Paul is really a master planner. He is a master administrator who leaves nothing to chance, so to speak. Right? Yet he, yes, he trusts the Lord, he does. But he does his due diligence. He's not sloppy, he's not loose in his management, but he's very thorough. Right? He knew the false apostles and false teachers were gunning for him. And he knew they were looking for anything to accuse him and take him down, to claim that he's underhanded, uh, to claim that he's trying to do something to, to, to benefit himself. So what does he do? He orchestrates this delegation to go to Corinth before him. And the delegation, as we looked at last time, were three men, three brethren, which consisted of Titus, also the brother, and finally our brother, all at the end of chapter 8. And these three men were chosen and approved by Paul and the churches to collect the Corinthians' offering and then bring it to Jerusalem. So there was Titus, who's been to Corinth a few times before, and he has worked with them, and he has brought the severe letter to them, and the severe letter uh, was basically calling them to repent, and Titus brought it, and God used Titus to help them. And they love Titus, and Titus loves them. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 8 that God put it into Titus' heart, the same earnest care for the Corinthians that Paul had. And when Paul asks Titus to go back to Corinth uh, and be part of this delegation, right, to pick up the offering, Titus not only agrees to do it, but he greatly desired to do it. And then the brother, we don't know who it is, but he says the brother who would go, was famous, we're told, or known by all the churches. And most likely, he was a gospel preacher who was appointed or voted by the churches to be part of the delegation. And finally, our brother, the third person, Paul said, was tested and found faithful often, who also had a great confidence in the people at Corinth. And all three of these men are called messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. Uh, so Paul is sending them ahead of himself and the others who would be coming with them so that when he arrives there, the gift would be ready. So they would be prepared. They would be prepared to give what they promised. This way, neither Paul nor the Corinthians would be embarrassed because Paul's been boasting about them, especially since some of the Macedonians are probably coming with Paul. So he wants them to follow through. He wants them to know the joy of giving, the joy of ministering through giving. He wants them to be a people of their word. And the job of the delegation was to help them to do that by encouraging them and challenging them and reminding them of their promise and the importance of keeping it. So Paul doesn't want to arrive there with, with, with some of the Macedonians with them and be surprised that the Corinthians, they're not ready. They're not ready with their offering. He's been boasting about them. He's boasting that the Corinthians have this great heart and desire and willingness to give. And now he would have egg on his face if he gets there with the Macedonians and they're scurrying around, right? If they're not ready. And they had a long time to be ready. The Macedonians, who have far, far less than the Corinthians, they were ready a long time ago. Listen, I brag about you to other pastors. I do. 
I tell them of your desire to pray. I tell them of your zeal for evangelism, your love for the truth, the sweet fellowship that we have here, how friendly you are. And if I was going to invite one of my pastor friends here to preach, I would be embarrassed if no one talked to him. I, I would be embarrassed if no one talked to him. I would be embarrassed if you were yawning through a sermon, looking at the clock, turning around, looking back there. I would be embarrassed. I would be embarrassed if nobody sang. Or, or, if, or if everybody just bolted out of here when the service was over, as soon as the benediction was read. You see, it would be embarrassing if, if I told them how spiritually minded you were and instead of carrying Bibles into the church, you're all carrying Harry Potter books here. I mean, I would be embarrassed. Because I, I boast about you. So I want egg on my face. I'll let you know when someone's coming. Well, Paul boasted about the Corinthians because he saw the grace of God in their lives. But because of their fallout with him due to the stirring up these false teachers and false apostles, and, and probably because of their own procrastination, they stopped the collection about a year before. And them not being ready now uh, would shame Paul before the Macedonians. Uh, that would make his boasting, boasting empty and vain. It, it would make his confidence in them look futile. And it would diminish the Corinthians' witness to the other churches. It would diminish the glory of God in this giving ministry. So look at how much thought and detail Paul has put into this collection for the suffering saints in, in Jerusalem. I mean, think about it. God could have just poured down manna from heaven uh, on, on these suffering saints. He just could have done that if he wanted to. He could have had the Romans and the Jews in Jerusalem just hand over their silver and gold, just give them all their money like he did to the Jews who were leaving Egypt. Right after the 10th plague, right? The Jews just wanted to get rid of them. And so they handed the people their gold and their silver. God could have done that. Could have done that. But he chose not to do that here. He chose to use the saints to give. Why? Because it shows the work of God in the hearts of his people. It shows the work of God in the hearts of his people. It shows that they trust in him to provide for him. To them. They trust that they trust in him. It shows the love of God among the people of God to the world around them. And in the end, who gets the glory? God gets the glory. So if the Corinthians aren't ready, then glory isn't given to God for their promised gift. So we see giving encourages, secondly, giving collected, and finally, giving generously giving generously. Verse 5. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Well, Paul wants the Corinthians to be prepared with their generous gift when he arrives there with some of the Macedonians. And now he talks about the gift itself and the heart in which it should be given. And so he says, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time. And so as we said, he sent a delegation ahead of him to help the Corinthians prepare their generous gift. And generous gift, in, 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 first of all, means a lot. It's a very, and, but it also in Greek means blessed. Blessed. And this gift was a blessing to the saints in Jerusalem who would receive it. And it was a blessing to the Corinthians who would give it. Paul said in Acts 20, 35, he said, remember the words of our Lord Jesus, that he said, it is more blessed to give than receive. Do we believe that? It is more blessed to give than receive. And it's a blessing because God is pleased with it. And we're acting like our Father who is a giver. The end of chapter 9, when we're not too far from it now, he's going to say, but thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Christ is a gift to us. You can't put a price tag on that. It far supersedes anything any of us give to anybody else, right? We read in Hebrews 13, 16, do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. He's well pleased. So it's a blessing to God. And as we will see in a few verses, that God loves a cheerful giver. He loves a cheerful giver. Uh, and it's a blessing to us because Proverbs 19, 17 says, it's as if we're lending it to the Lord. We're giving it back to the Lord. Lord, use this. It's yours anyway, but I give it back. 
And it's a blessing because in Christ, we are already very wealthy people. And we're just giving some of what's been given to us. So what a privilege it is to use our stuff to benefit others. What a privilege it is to use our stuff for the advancement of the kingdom. Because ultimately it's his stuff which we're just managing for him while we're here. Like the early saints in Acts chapter 4 who used their money and possessions to aid the saints in need. So then there is great joy in being a giver and great benefit for it keeps us from being covetous. And, and it keeps us from being fearful and worrying about what we have. And listen, if you're not blessed to give, you got to ask yourself, why am I not blessed to give? Maybe you're covetous. Maybe you're fearful or worried. Maybe those things have captured your heart. Well, Paul ends by saying he wants them to be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Uh, and what a grudging obligation literally means is not affected by covetousness. Not affected by covetousness. Uh, and what, what Paul doesn't want is to show up in Corinth with the Macedonians and then, and then, and then the Corinthians are all scurrying around. Oh, Paul's going to be here in a day. Give us the money. Give us the money. Let's get money in the pot before Paul comes. Because they don't really want to do it. If you're scurrying around, it's not top of mind. Not of most importance. For it might look like they were forced into it. Oh, we got one day to make this thing right. Let's scurry and get the money together. Or they were pressured to give. Thus being a grudging obligation. No. Paul wants their gift to be a response to God's grace working in their lives. And he, he wants them to have a willing spirit. And not the sense that they're pushed into this thing or forced into this thing or twisted their arm into this thing. He wants their gift to be a blessing to them. He wants them to see that, that not holding on to stuff uh, and, and letting it go for the good of others and the kingdom is a blessing. And the question is this, are you blessed to give to the church? Are you blessed to give to the saints and to missionaries? Or is it a burden? Is it a burden? Is it a burden to you? Are you blessed that your money helps the gospel go out and, th and that there is a lighthouse for it here in Woodhaven? Are you blessed? Uh, so are you blessed to give? So we're going to have a place to gather and worship and train up the saints. So then, will it be a blessing to you and to your soul to put something into the offering plate as it goes around in a few minutes? Or will it be a struggle? Will it be a struggle? Will you throw in a few bucks because you have to? Because people may be looking. Or maybe you'll just let it pass by. I sincerely hope that giving today and for the rest of your lives and my life would be a blessing to you and me and that we would know the joy of it. Listen, we said back in chapter 8, giving is a grace. I've never told you how much you should give, and I'm going to tell you next week, I don't even believe in tithing. If you disagree with me, okay, give the 10%. But listen, and I'll tell you why. Not next week, in two weeks, I guess. All right? Because he's going to say you know, that, that how to give and how much to give. But he never gives a number. He gives the kind of heart. It's always about the heart. Let me close by asking you just one question. Do you need to be stirred up today? Do you need to be stirred up today? Uh, do you need to be stirred up to give generously and with a good heart back to God? Uh, do you need to be stirred up to be a gracious giver, one who gives out of love for God for the love that he's poured out on you? Uh, do you need to be stirred up to give freely from a heart overflowing with joy and not out of fear or worry? A heart that trusts him to provide for you, a heart that sees everything that you have as his already anyway. Maybe you once saw those things this way, but, uh, and maybe once you gave that way with a good and generous heart, but for whatever reason, maybe not so today. Well, if that's you, I would encourage you to go to the great stirrer upper, the Lord Jesus Christ, the great stirrer upper, who left heaven and glory and took upon himself humanity, leaving the riches of eternity that he had with his father and taking on the poverty which is in this world. So he became poor for your sake so that you could become rich. He lowered himself below our level so that he could raise us up to his level. Therefore, you are today eternally wealthy. Why? 
because he was willing to come and to save you from your sins. He was willing to come and save you of your sins. He followed through. He followed through. You see, if he was willing, if he was willing, just willing, that wouldn't be enough. If he was just willing, it wouldn't be enough. No, no, he had to follow through. What if he said, Father, I'll go. I'll live among them. I'll be like a worm among them. I'll be a man of sorrows. I'll be like an outcast among my own people. If he was just willing to come but didn't follow through, we'd all be in bad shape. We'd all be in bad shape. Praise God, he did follow through. For he prophetically said in Hebrews 10, 5 to 7, Therefore, when he, Jesus, came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. And he did his will. He did his will. And his will was not just to come, but to get up on the cross and literally suffer as a sin bearer for his people. To take God's very wrath for the sin we deserve and will receive without him and do it for us. We read in Luke 9, 51, that he steadfastly, that means he was absolutely diligent to set his face to go to Jerusalem. He knew the cross was waiting. He knew the eight-inch spikes were waiting. He knew the the one-inch crown of thorns were waiting. He knew the wrath of God was waiting. That's why he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, because he knew what he had to drink. And he knew it was going to be brutal. He told his disciples in Matthew 16 that he had to go to Jerusalem. Most people wouldn't go to Jerusalem because they knew it would be death. And his death was not just physical, it was a spiritual pounding at the very hands of God. And if anyone knows the wrath of God, Jesus knew the wrath of God. He said in John 10 that he would lay down his life for the sheep. He knew what that meant, and he did. Galatians 2.20 says he loved us and gave himself for us. That's the cross, he gave himself for us. Ephesians 5.25 says that he loved the church and gave himself for her. The church, not North Shore Baptist Church, not Baptist, Presbyterian, or any other group, believers, every single born-again believer. That's the church, universal church. We learned about it today in Sunday school again. He did it for the church, his bride, his betrothed. Hebrews 9.27 tells us he was offered himself up as a sin offering once for all time. He did it for us. He fulfilled it. So that ought to stir the people of God up to live for him, but also to be generous givers. It ought to stir us up. We've got to go back to the great stirrer upper. Now, if you're not saved today, you could throw $100,000 in that plate as it passes by, and it will not make you one inch more righteous in God's eyes. If you're not saved, it won't make a difference. It'll not buy you into heaven. It'll not take away even one sin. And believe you me, you got a boatload. We all have a boatload. The only thing that'll buy you heaven is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That is the only thing that can take away sins and make you just and right before God. Only receiving the gift of salvation in Christ alone will bring you forgiveness of sins and eternal life. But you must acknowledge that you are a sinner before a holy God. You must acknowledge you need forgiveness and you can't get it on your own. You are not capable. I met a guy yesterday on the street and he just said, I haven't killed anybody. I never raped a woman. You know, I've never robbed a store. You know, I'm a good guy. I said, well, good guys go to hell because the Bible says there's none good, no, not one. I said, you need a savior. And that's what we need. We must acknowledge these things. I am a sinner before a holy God. I need forgiveness because I sin against him. And then you need to repent. Turn from your sins, acknowledge your sins, and trust in Christ and Christ alone. That God gave up his son up to a cross for you, you personally, not just us old nebulous world, you. And that the gift of Christ is for you. If you believe that, you cry out for that, he'll save your soul. He'll raise you up. He'll make you his child. He'll make you ready for heaven. He'll bless you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Repent and believe today. Let's pray. Father, how we thank you that you are the great giver, not only in things in this life, but Lord, you've given us eternal life in your Son. 
And Father, we thank you that we have life and life abundantly. We thank you you've saved our souls and that we're rich in spiritual things. Help us to be rich in physical things. Help us to be generous in what you've given us. Help us to not hoard or worry or skimp. Lord, help us to be generous like you are generous. And Father, I pray uh, for the soul or souls in this room that aren't truly saved, never come to a saving faith in Christ. They don't love them. They like them, maybe, but they don't love you. They're not driven by their love for you and your love for them to live for you. Would you today, Lord, rivet their soul, draw them to the Son, grant them the gift of life, save them and make them rich in Christ, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.